Uh, welcome members, welcome to the COVID-19 virtual event series. This session is going to be a legal lunch and learn. Um, we do have HAR legal counsel Grant Harpold on with us. Good, good afternoon. It's officially afternoon, Grant. How are you? <laughs> oh, great. Good afternoon. Good to see you. And Grant is, is tired of being at home, so he put on a suit and tie for us today. <laughs> but I'm still at home. But you're still at home, yes. <laughs> and, thank you. <laughs> and thank you for doing that. Um, I do see one person said they cannot hear. Uh, I'm assuming everyone else can hear us. So um, hopefully she's able to figure out her audio there. But we'll go ahead and get started with today's virtual event series. Again, this is a legal lunch and learn. Um, we uh, do have some topics ready that Grant is going to be discussing. Uh, with us today. So uh, we, we have some things planned for you guys, but as always, if you have questions, type them in. You'll notice if you're typing questions into the chat, it does give you the option to type that question in so it's visible just to panelists. So that would be Grant and myself or to panelists and everyone else. So everybody could potentially see that question and reply to you. So um, just be aware of that as you're typing something in, it has where you can type just to panelists, but also to panelists and everyone in attendance today and attendees. So uh, you have those options. There's also the actual Q&A section too, where you can type things in. Um, so either one, I will be checking both as we go through. Again, Grant does have, does have some things that he prepared that he would like to, to show you guys and discuss with you. But of course, if you have questions, we will answer those too. Um, I want to remind everyone that this is a series. We do have a session scheduled tomorrow uh, with Brad Inman of Inman News and HR's president and CEO, Bob Hale. We also have Christy Kennelly with uh, Realtor.com, who's going to be on this Friday. And we have more scheduled next week, and we're scheduling some in May as well. So if you haven't yet, go to HAR.com slash webinars to sign up for any of those. All right, Grant, I'm going to uh, turn the floor over to you. And again, we do have some slides. So just let me know when you'd like me to show those to our members. Um, but I'll go ahead and, and let you take the floor. Well, it, uh, like you said, good afternoon. It's great to be here. Excited to talk about these things and uh, trust everybody is doing well and um, hope to have fun and gain some knowledge and uh, have a great day. So here we go. So we're, we're going to talk first about uh, the forms, sort of the the new form, whether well, the new forms in, in light of the coronavirus virus, and also because of uh, the clear cooperation rule. So let's uh, let's start with the listing agreement because the listing agreement, Christine, if you'll put up that sort of notice that's that um, I try to make as clear as possible. There it is. So we have a new listing agreement, and the and the changes to the listing agreement brought about by the clear cooperation policy rule change that is will be effective may 1. so any listing going forward may 1 going forward will have to take in light take you know be aware follow the new uh rule on the clear cooperation meaning that if if you're going to have if you're not going to have it on the mls you can't publicly market the property and so that's that's clearly what's going on here and why the listing agreement was changed. It's not retroactive, meaning that it doesn't apply to current listings or any listings prior to May 1, 2020, but it applies to all listings May 1, 2020 and forward. And Christine, if you can pull up the uh, particular pages, we can just dial right in and focus right in on what was changed. And you can, I don't know that you can, read that well but it's essentially on page three which is a uh, familiar language to us all about uh the listing i mean the, like i said the the overall use of the document and the content of the document is not really changing except for incorporating this new rule and so there from the very onset in paragraph six uh under listing services is a new provision or a new paragraph notice regarding public marketing and so this once again is is putting the seller on notice as part of this listing agreement if 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 the, if, if you're not going to have the property in the mls and you can't cannot public market the property and it kind of defines as best one can 
uh, about what is public marketing. And so that, that sort of sets the stage right there for uh, advising the seller about what is going on if they choose to go the route of non-MLS uh, entry. And so then on the second page, or the, actually the next page, which is page four, it also kind of recaps again the, uh, the, the issue of public marketing, and it has an acknowledgement, so, and that's what the language is. It's just basically now having the seller acknowledge all these things in relation to public marketing. So bear in mind, I mean, let's not, let's not totally freak out about any of this stuff. Bear, bear in mind, this is typically going to be for a small percentage of, uh, of sellers. I mean, this is for, in my estimation or my opinion, and for, you know, a very unique property that doesn't need to be on the MLS for some privacy issue or some other market issue. And so the seller has chosen to go this route. And so, like I said, it's, it's, it's you know, in my mind, if you want to sell a property and fulfill your duties to the seller, and if the seller really wants the property to perhaps gain the best market value price, you want it on the MLS. You want it in the broad market, you want everybody to see it. But we recognize that there is a situation where, you know, there might be a limited reason for not having on the MLS. And if you are gonna go that route seller, bear in mind, you can't do any of these uh, public marketing of the property, you or your agent or anybody on behalf of you. And if that were to occur, then the property must go into the MLS within one business day of that public marketing event. So that's kind of, that's the purpose of, the, of why the listing agreement was changed. And, um, and so we also, in and I'm just going to keep talking, Christina, <laughs> and, and I'll just talk for an hour. But anyway, <laughs> we also changed the, uh, to, again, to, to highlight the public marketing uh, aspect of the MLS if you're, if you're not going to be on it. And, uh, and being aware of this rule, we changed up the authorization to exclude it from the MLS, which is Form 300, I believe. Mm -hmm. We we are incorporated that that form is still exists and that form still needs to be used if the property is going off MLS. Right. And we added again that link. We added similar language like you see here to that form, just letting the seller be fully informed about um, about you know what happens if if it goes if you start publicly marketing the property and kind of defining what office exclusive is because that's really right. if you're not going to be on the MLS it's going to be office exclusive so and it's actually, yeah so we actually do have some members yeah. already asking Grant if you could define what public marketing is versus well like I mean office. you know and that's that's the beauty of this form it uh NAR's definition is right there and so and it's also in our exclusion, in the, the authorization to exclude off MLS in our form, the HAR form, it's also there too. But you can see it right here. And, uh, you know, it's uh, flyers displayed in windows, yard signs, digital marketing on public-facing websites, brokerage website displays, uh, multi-brokerage listings, sharing networks, and other applications available to the general public. Here, here's my, here's how I view it. Mm -hmm. it, it if, if you're if you're if you're not going to put it on the MLS, you cannot profile the property outside of your brokerage office, basically. And so, all discussion or all promotion, let's say, all promotion marketing of the property is is not allowed outside of your office. Meaning, you can have discussions in your office about this property that's not on the MLS. You can talk to your agents about this property that's not on the MLS and you can have discussions with your client about this property that's not on the MLS. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, if you start spreading out beyond your office in some sort of, like I said, promotion, marketing, uh, communication, however you, whatever verb or adjective you want to use, then you could come in violation of this rule and if that were to occur, 
then you have one business day to put it on the MLS. So for example, if I stuck a sign in the yard mm -hmm. on Tuesday, just, uh, I don't know why, all of a sudden, even though it was not on the MLS, I decided to stick a sign in the yard. Uh, that property needs to be on the MLS by, on Wednesday. Okay. So that's kind of, and so the, you know, I, I think there's going to be some learning on this and, and there's going to be some forgiveness and some patience and some, uh, it's like any other rule that comes about. I mean, there, there's always a learning curve. There's always ways to get better as we learn. And so this is, this is uh, ultimately, you know, the purpose of the rule is to, is to provide the property to the broader market. And, right. uh, if, I mean, if, if, if somebody's going to see the property out there, they got to be able to have access to it on the MLS. If you're going to, you're going to market the property and not put it on the, on the MLS, that's not fair to the other agents who happen to come across the property and can't gain access to it. That makes sense. That's so the we do have some, yeah. some questions coming in that I, I think uh, we should address here, Grant. Um, Jennifer Weaver wants some clarification. She said, I thought there was going to be a coming soon option in the MLS. There is, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. So she said, if so, how does that work in light of having to put a listing in MLS within one business well, day? Well, coming soon, you'll, you'll be on the MLS. Mm -hmm. And so, so you're, you're now part of the MLS. You're in, if you're in the, if you, if you, if you activate the coming soon, uh, program then that's where you are there now there are certain limitations to coming soon you can't have no showings you the property has to go active within 14 days or it'll be automatically withdrawn and so uh, you can have photos or you cannot have photos mm -hmm. it's your call uh, it will not be on hr.com or any of the third party sort of public facing websites you know right. the theory behind, the theory behind coming soon is i mean you know, a legitimate reason. I mean, you need to maybe you took the listing and there maybe needs some repairs that need to be done. Maybe some something happened on the photoing, got to do some more photo shoots or do some staging. Something that causes you or your client to need more time before you make it active. And so that's that's the theory is is to is to uh, allow that opportunity to occur, but it's still part of the MLS. Sure. A lot of people are asking, so are coming soon signs not going to be allowed anymore? Um, no, you can still have a sign. They are. I mean, right. You can yeah. be an MLS. So, you, so you're, you're allowed to public market it, but it's not, its status in MLS is not allowing it to, to do the other things that it would once it becomes active. Sure. And like I just mentioned, no showings, no public uh, broadcasting of it in the sense it's not on hr.com it's not on third-party websites stuff stuff that you would have once it becomes active very good um, Ed Wolf said so anything we see via email or advertisement as coming soon must be on the MLS within 24 hours of someone receiving that email if it's not on the MLS already yes one business day very good uh, Kathy Trevino asked, what is the violation fee? Well, those are, those will be in the rules and then it's, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's kind of stair-stepped, if you will. I think it, uh, my, I don't recall the, the first fine. I think it's maybe, it could be a thousand dollars. I mean, I don't recall specifically, but it is, it's, it's, it's tiered. I mean, depending on the, the first time, the second time, the third time, I mean, there is, it's, it's not unlike. It's not unlike any other rule where there's fines involved. This rule, like the other rules, has, has fines that are set up for it. And so the process on fines will be similar to any other rule. Now, because this is a new rule, I'm, I'm, I'm feel confident that we, the MLS, will, will be patient and be um, uh, sort of a soft opening, if you will, on, on implementing all of this. But, uh, but yes, ultimately, it's, it's like any other rule. There'll be fines that are that are involved and they'll be part of the rule um we had just some clarification um shally was asking so if she heard correctly that if she has a listing dated today and she said not that i'm going to do this but if she had a listing dated today 
can an agent continue to market it to the public as coming soon for an indefinite period of time or come May 1, are you required to put it in the MLS? How does that work? Any listing, any current listing is not subject to the rule, okay. to the new rule. The new rule is subject to any listing May 1 going forward. So in answer to her, her question, yes, you could still, you could still operate as you have been operating up until May 1 relative to marketing a non-MLS property. Very good. Nancy Herzig asked, could you please explain the difference between coming soon and paragraph 6A1B, which authorizes delay of marketing the property? Well, if you well, if you're not, if you have it set up to where it's not on MLS yet, for whatever reason, you've signed the authorization, you're holding it out of the MLS for X number of days, that's its own box. If you, if you do want to take advantage of the coming soon aspect of, your, of the listing, then it, then it is gonna be on the MLS, and, and at, per the rule, that status should only last 14 days. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this actually came up anonymous attendee, so I'm not sure who asked this, but they said, <laughs> why are there no showings when a property is coming soon? Did I understand that correctly? You did understand that correctly, and that's a good question. I think uh, the sort of the, the, uh, the task force, the members, the people that looked at this issue uh, debated that pretty strongly back and forth. And so I think it is ultimately decided that uh, this no showings would be the best route. And so that's, that's how it's set up, at least for now. Okay. Um, Deborah asked, does this apply to rental listings as well as sales? The, the, the new MLS uh, clear policy rule does not, clear cooperation rule, does not apply to rentals, no. Um, we have a, just some clarification on the amount of time. So is it one business day or 24 hours? One business day. One business day, okay. <laughs> Every hour counts. Um, Teresa said, uh, Teresa Hill said she believes that the first fine is $1,000, the second is $2,500, and the third is $5,000. I think she's right. I believe so, too. Okay. Um, yeah, and again, so it seems like there's a little bit of confusion um, because it's not, we're not eliminating coming soon. In fact, we're adding it into the MLS it's almost, it's really just like a regulation on it. Is that correct, Grant? That's just a status. Now, we, we never had coming soon before, so now this is a new status. Mm -hmm. It will be something like the other statuses that you have available. This is, this, and like I said, not everybody, this is not something that is mandatory that somebody has to use. This is just if you're in that situation where you need it for your client, mind you, this is all for the benefit of the client, ultimately, for the consumer. So if, if your particular situation dictates that the property needs some more time to repair or whatever, then maybe this is the route you go. Maybe not. Mm -hmm. Maybe it doesn't matter to your client. And so so it's really it's it's a case by case call. It's not mandatory. It's just another service that's available and um, and maybe it maybe you'll never use it. Maybe you'll use it quite often. Really, I think it depends on the client and the property. Okay. Um, Vicki said, just to clarify, if a seller needs a certain amount of days to get the product, and I see a few people asking this in different wording, so we'll answer Vicki's, and hopefully that, that satisfies everybody's answer that's asking this. Um, if a seller needs a certain amount of days to get the property ready, and that is notated on the listing amendment, then we can put out a coming soon sign and we need to go ahead and put it in the MLS as coming soon within uh, 24 hours. Yes, yes, within one business day. Right. So the idea is if, if, it's, if it's not going to be ready within 14 days, then it shouldn't be coming soon yet. Is that, is that the idea? I think that's 
Yeah, I mean, because otherwise you're either going to go active and you're not ready, which may be fine. I mean, that, that may be fine. Or you're going to, or it's, if, if you do nothing, it's going to be withdrawn. Yeah. And, so, uh, yeah. So, you know, it's, and, and so, you know, you know, coming soon, like I said, coming soon is not mandatory. You don't have to use it. You could, uh, right. If you sit, you could simply keep it off MLS for X days and then as, as provided in the listing agreement, and then, uh, and and then when you're ready to go active, you put it on the MLS as long as as long as long. And here's the key now: as long as you don't do public marketing during that period, coming soon allows you to do public marketing during this off period if you're keeping it off for some property seller related issue uh, dealing with the property. Okay, very good. Um... And again, some people clarifying the amount of time. It is 14 days. Um, yes. During that 14 days that you have it in coming soon status in the MLS, you can market it to the public. Yes. Uh, Anne asked a question here that I don't think has been asked yet, uh, but it's a, it's a good one. Will the general public be able to see properties in the coming soon status on HAR.com? No. Um, so, and Stephanie asked the same question, is it for agents only? Very good. Um, if we check, uh, Leah Bell asked, if we check the 6A1B, is the 300 authorization form still required? Yes. Um, and yes, Whitney, that's what I think we just answered that. Coming soon status, she said, will it, will it be searchable to all agents? Yes, it will. And that's, that's the goal, right, of the coming soon status is for people to be able to find it in the MLS. Very good. Yes, that's right. And, uh, that, and, that, makes it, and that makes it in compliance with the new NAR rule, the clear cooperation uh, rule. Okay. And so that's, so that's all, it's all kind of woven together, yes. Very good. Um, some clarification here from Matt. The only real limitation of coming soon is no showings. Otherwise, you can market it freely. Pretty much. I mean, like I said before, it's not going to go on HAR. And as we just discussed, it won't be on HAR.com. And it won't be, it won't be fed to other third-party public-facing websites. Right. So. Very good. Matt followed up with that a little bit later. Um, very good. So Ed just has a comment here. Before, we didn't have a good way on MLS to announce a property that was being prepared for the market. So I think this is a good tool. Good. I'm glad Ed likes it. Yeah. <laughs> um, what is the difference between incomplete and coming soon status? So incomplete has not gone into the MLS. You are the only one that can see it when it's incomplete, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. True. And I, and I believe your broker can see it as well when it's incomplete. Um, very good. Uh, just a question here from Melanie. Why isn't coming soon uh, searchable for the public? Because it, it's not being fed to HR.com yet. And I guess the theory behind this is it's not ready. It's not, you know, there may not be photos because I think I mentioned that before. Photos is an option. It's not mandatory. Whereas if it was on active, you would have to have photos. And so, uh, so bottom line is, you know, under the theory that there's a reason, a good reason for this, you know, the property is not really ready to go active. And for, like I said, there's a repair, there's what, what other good reason to not get this thing on the market and start selling it to the public you know, on a broad basis. Okay. Um, so uh, some clarification, and we kind of talked about this already, but again, the, the terms public marketing um, yeah. tend, to, tend to confuse people because it, we, we just want some clarification. So Paige, Paige Martin asked, um, can you expand on public marketing as it applies to sellers? If Jane Doe lists with me, we are under an agreement in paragraph 6A1B, I am not publicly marketing and Jane posts in a mom's group on Facebook and allows showings. What implication does that have on the agent? Well, I think that's why we, we, we highlighted these provisions in the listing agreement, which on the front end, talk about it there at the beginning of paragraph six. And then on the back end, 
acknowledge from the seller about its limitations. And so under under my reading of the of the of the NAR rule, that would be public marketing and that and so it would have to go on the MLS within one business day of that event. Okay. Um another question here can you accept offers during coming soon status yes okay uh, question here about how this applies to new construction so how would this apply to new construction doesn't well new construction meaning that the the the, the new rule that the public marketing rule as i tend to call it the clear cooperation rule if it's new construction involving like a, a host of condominiums, like a mid-rise, where there's multiple properties that are being developed, or a development in a neighborhood with a builder with multiple properties, in, in theory, the rule does not apply to that situation. Okay. There is uh, some clarification. Kim asked about when coming soon is launching. So when will it be in the MLS? And also there was a question about when these forms will be available uh, both in zip form and on HAR. Well, the, the new listing form, I believe is, it should, is on zip form. I think that's where I got this. I, I mean, I'm kind of looking at it now. Where did I get it? Anyway, I think it, yes, I think the new listing form is on zip forms already. The, the, the authorization to exclude from the MLS, which is the HAR 300 form. I did not see that on zip yet, but I think it's available on, you know, through HAR.com. Okay. And, and, and either way, they're, they're gonna be available in time. Okay, so. very good. Um, just I just got word that our director of MLS, Sean Dauphine, is, is watching as well. Um, so I see a lot of questions coming in. Uh, remember when you're typing into the chat, um, if you could just type it into the chat and change it from all from just showing to the panelists, but to show to everyone, panelists and all attendees. And that way, Sean, because otherwise Sean can't see your questions. So he can actually go through and answer some of the questions that we may not get to. So when you're typing something into the chat, uh, if you want other people on this call, other HAR staff to be able to see it, make, make sure it goes to panelists and attendees. And I see Peggy just recent her question. So thank you there, Peggy. I'm glad, I'm glad people are figuring it out. Okay, excellent. Um, all right. So was there anything else on that? I see. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. Blake did ask something else. If the coming soon is withdrawn because it goes past 14 days, can it be relisted later? Yeah, it can go active later. Yes. Okay. Um, I got more forms. You want me to talk about forms or? I, I was just, I'm double checking the question here from Allison. I saw she, she actually sent this uh, tw twice. So I want to make sure we get to it. Uh, why would HAR 300 be used on coming soon? The seller is not excluding from MLS, but is in MLS. And under the first box, under item six in the HAR 3. 300 conflicts with that. Can you give us some clarification there, Grant? That was a mouthful. So, um, <laughs> um, so she's basically asking why would the HR 300 be used on coming soon? Um, uh, the seller is not, it would not, it would not be. Okay. So if, if that, that was, if that was inferred or implied, then that, no, you would not use, you would not use 300 the form 300 if you're going coming soon because form 300 is you're going off the MLS. Coming soon means you're going on to the MLS. Okay, very good. Um, and again, just a reminder, as you're typing um, these questions into the chat, make sure it's visible to all panelists and attendees. Um, how could you enforce, how is this gonna be enforced? I see a lot of people asking, how is this gonna be enforced? Can agents report these violations to HAR? It, it's it will be enforced like any other rule violation. I mean, there is it's 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 this is another rule in the MLS rules, which there are multiple rules and enforcement or will be uh, not unlike previous enforcement on other rules. Okay. 
uh, we're trying to work the system here, Grant. Can you withdraw a coming soon on day 13 and then relist it as coming soon later? No. <laughs> yeah, no. And our and our our system is designed to pick all that stuff up. Is that correct? To catch all of that. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm sitting there watching. <laughs> Very good. Okay, and I see Sean's answering some questions there, uh, and Richard Ortiz is also answering some questions. He said that the latest uh, TXR 1101 and HR 300 are available in zip form now, so they're already there in zip. Oh, form. perfect. Excellent. There you go. Thank you for letting us know, Richard. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, so we wanted to ask you also, and if you guys have more questions about this, you can feel free to type them in. Again, uh, type them in so where a panelist and attendees can see, just in case we miss it. Um, oh, one more question here. When will the coming soon be available for use? When will this be in the MLS? I think somebody asked that already too. Soon. soon. Coming soon. Coming it's soon. Coming, coming soon. soon. Yes. Very good. Okay. So I wanted to, uh, you to give us a little update to um, maybe an update or an overview of the fourth round of stimulus. Um, there have been okay. some, some updates. So if you, if you could update us on, on what's going right. on. Well, that just got passed um, last night, mm -hmm. and um, and so that's a good thing. And so, um, you know, it, I don't know what it's not funny, but it's kind of interesting that the program that initially launched a couple of weeks ago they ran out of money. I mean, it was so, I guess, popular, or it remains be seen how successful but at least you know we ran they ran out of money so this now refunded the programs that already existed and so and and i just looked at some of this stuff and i know our our members are trying to understand where they fit in and all of this and to be honest i don't think even right now it's that clear for self-employed slash independent contractors but according to the experts this new package which uh, funds the old uh, programs applies to it should apply to members to small businesses to independent contractors to self-employed and there's as I see it there's three there's three programs here really a lot of focus has been on unemployment and do we qualify for unemployment and I you know I've yet to meet anybody that's gotten through and said, I got money. I mean, I, I just, it's, that's a realtor or that's a licensee. And so that is still there. And, you know, you can go to, um, you can uh, go to the Texas Realtor website and punch in unemployment search, and it'll come up with all sorts of advice and tell you how to do it. But ultimately you got to go to the Texas Workforce Commission website and go through the application process. So that's unemployment. There's other things. There's the payment protection plan, and there's the economic injury disaster loan. Now these things are, are look to be pretty good programs, and they still apply to independent contractors and self-employed individuals. And so, those programs might even be better than employment. I saw a debate in Forbes magazine that actually found a when they ran a a model that the payment protection plan ended up providing more compensation than unemployment. Unemployment is taxable income. Mm -hmm. Payment protection plan loan may not be, or certain parts of it may be forgiven and there may be no tax implication. And then the economic, economic injury disaster loan is similar. Those plans run through your bank. The rest, I think they're SBA sponsored, but you get them through your bank. And so you're saying, well, I don't really know a banker. Well, if you, most of us have a bank, and if you have a bank, you should, you know, go to that bank, go to somebody at that bank, wherever you bank, and and talk to them about this payment protection plan, or you know, talk to a neighbor, talk to somebody, you know, friend, neighbor, Facebook, you know, whatever social media you can kind of dial into a banker or somebody that you know may give you a little bit you know, wider door to open to walk into and check out this payment protection plan or the economic injury disaster loan. And really the payment protection plan seems is the one that 
uh, is really designed for small businesses. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, 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 you know, and like I said, they ran out of money. So now they're being funded again. And so that another round of loans should be available. And I don't know how long that money's going to last. So mm -hmm. if, if you're, if you're in need as, as a self-employed, uh, individual or you're a small business with a few agents whatever or, or you're both uh you know your business and you individually so um so that's out there i like i said i i would like to find somebody that actually is going through the unemployment process to see how that worked out and actually got are getting money or expected to get money but um so anyway those those don't just don't just dial in the unemployment. The, these other plans may work better for you or work just as good. Right. Um, so just a couple comments. I don't really see questions about this at this time. Um, just comments uh, coming through. Um, someone said small banks will not take you if you are not a customer. Um, just a couple other comments about, I think they were for everybody to see, so. And, I, and when I say, you know, if you have a checking account with the bank or a savings account or a loan, you're a customer. Mm -hmm. And so now whether, you know, how, how it works with them beyond that, you know, that's between you and your bank and maybe that might, you know, shed, shed some light on whether you're gonna be a customer of that bank in the future. Okay. Vicki Fullerton made a comment as well. Um, it says applications made to commu the community banks are a better resource for independent contractors rather than big banks. So that's just uh, her. Yeah, um, so when I was kind of, when I said your friend, your neighbor, I mean, that's kind of, that's, that's kind of that angle. Is. Yeah. The, the kind of the, uh, you know, it might work better at a community bank than going to chase. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not, Chase is great. I'm not saying anything negative, but I mean, there's, right. there's you know, it's, you know, it's a market. It's a marketplace. There's other ways of doing deals, and certain banks do it one way, and other banks do it another way. Shelley said she had great success with Amogee, which is a, a Texas bank. So. Yeah. Um, just a comment here. Uh, oh, Lauren asked, uh, "What was the program you mentioned?" Payment Protection Plan is one of them, PPP, Payment Protection Plan. And the other one is the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, E-I-D-L, E-I-D-L, Economic Injury Disaster Loan. Mm -hmm. Pearl just had a comment um, that she's really hoping that uh, maybe NAR could read this and give more concise information um, as it pertains to realtors. She's just really looking for more direction and guidance. Well, I think, uh, you know, TR, and I'm sure NAR has it too, but I did check TR. There, if, you, if, you, if you go to the TR website and search unemployment, they, they have some good information there. And, uh, and I think a lot of it might be geared towards the unemployment side, but like I said, don't forget about the other equation. This, the uh, payment protection plan or the economic injury disaster model. And that, and that's really, you know, that's really dealing with somebody at a bank. I mean, it's, I don't, you know, you ultimately have to fill out forms, but you actually physically or over the internet, you're dealing with somebody versus an application process with whoever it is at Workforce Commission. So. Um, Amber, and hopefully everybody saw this, and uh, Diana also agreed, NAR has a dedicated page that's being updated daily. Um, so, uh, Indu asked, can you apply for both? Good question. And now I've seen two, I've seen opinions that if you do unemployment, you can't do PPP or EIDL. And, and then I saw another one where well, they said you can actually, there, there are some lines of division between wh what you're getting from one versus the other. And so, uh, I guess, in my mind, you can't double dip. So if you're, if the information you're feeding unemployment is the same information you're feeding to PPP in order to get the loan or in order to get the unemployment, then you might say, wait a second, I, I got to choose one. 
you might qualify for both, but then you get to, you know, I, I don't, I would be careful about taking from both. Right. Um, Lauren asked, just to clarify, you indicated that with these programs, they aren't considered income like unemployment would be. Ask your banker. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, there's certain aspects of it that may not be like, like I said, it, it some of it may be forgiven and so that's where it might be considered income and then i saw something else if it is forgiven then they're waiving that as being an, a taxable event you know in, in the real world if you had a loan that was forgiven that's a taxable event mm -hmm. in this world it may not be because of you know aiding the person in need very good um i've seen this from a few members um LaVon asked, and I, I've seen this a lot, and it's, I, I think people are kind of posing the question to, e, to, our, to us as much as they are to each other. Um, can realtors or teams ethically apply for PPP or unemployment when realtors are considered essential workers? I don't, the, the issue of essential workers I don't see that as I, I, that was a that was an issue related to going to work or not or going to the office. Now that may that may come up in the in the process of of uh, applying for whatever you apply for. But I think bottom line is you as an in, independent contractor or self employed person are eligible for these programs. Mm -hmm. Period. Very good. Thank you. All right. Um, so what uh, what else did you want to cover with us? Did, were we going to speak at all about? Uh, uh, I got, let's talk about, um, you know, I did, I'm sure everybody's aware of the other forms that TR has related to the COVID-19, the addendum to extend closing and terminate if ultimately you can't close. The lease payment plan agreement, which is a little bit confusing. So uh, good luck on that one. Um, the certification for property access, uh, the, and there's also a commercial addendum for extending closing. Mm -hmm. I think all of these forms, you know, are usable. Like I said, the rental one seemed a little bit, uh, tougher to navigate, but, um, they're, they're available and they can be used. And, you know, the bottom line is it, it takes two to, to make it work. I mean, if, 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 if you want it, if your buyer wants it or your seller wants it and the other party doesn't, you know, you can't force them to sign it. And, and always remember that whether you use one of these special addendums that have been created for the pandemic, mm -hmm. fine, or you can just still use the, the old amendment form that allows you to amend the contract and extend the closing to do this, do that, whatever, whatever you need. So, okay. so there are forms available. There's more helpful forms if you need them. Um, those, those are there. The um, Sherry, asked, think, Sherry asked, do we need to have all buyers sign the form before showings? Which form? Um, I think she's talking about the um, one of the, the new COVID forms. Well, oh, if you're, it, there's the access form. Here, I'll pull it up right here. Anybody going into the property would have to, you know, uh, sign off on that form. It's, uh, that is the, and that's um, the certification for property access. And so, um, so yes, you would, you would need to sign off on that for entering the property, yes. And what if, that, is if that form you're talking about. And what is that form number in case someone asks? You no, know, that's the, um, not the, they don't, it, there is no form number, and I don't know why, and, and I apologize for not finding out why, but there is no form number. But if you go to COVID-19 on TR's homepage, there's an actual, you know, click through right, right there on their homepage, and you click on that, it'll take you to a page that will tell you about all these forms. Mm -hmm. and, and it has this form, even though it's not a form number on Zipped, because it's not on Zipped. All right. I see someone sharing. Um, Rico's or uh, Ricky, excuse me, is sharing some links. So I'm sharing those with everyone as well. Um, 
would the would the access form be required for a lease property? If you, it's uh, I don't know that it's written, or it, but I would think yes, it could be used for that. Let me just grab it here. I didn't look at it in that light, um, but I think it's. Uh, yeah, I think it's uh, it's for any. It, I think it would work for a listed property, rental or for sale. Okay. Then we had the uh, where? How are we doing on time, Christina? Um, we are at twelve forty-four, so you still have some time. <laughs> uh, I know one of the um, one of the things that um, we talked about seller disclosure notice. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about that or you have something, some questions, it's more questions. Um, mostly it's comments coming in. Okay. If a, uh, if a agent doesn't return the COVID-19 access form, what is our liability? Well, you don't have to use it. So it's, it's not, it's not mandatory. Uh, if you do use it, it doesn't mean everything's going to be, you know, liability free. So that so, you know the I don't know. There's any form that's perfect, and I don't know even if somebody got sick. I don't. I think there's another issue on you know that they get sick at the house or at the store or at their neighbors or at home. I mean, I mean, there's there's a multitude of issues. I think I think the purpose of that form is just to sort of put at ease to mm -hmm. some degree what's going on, and hopefully. You know, filter out what risk may exist, but it's not perfect. Tracy said it's a peace of mind form. <laughs> yes, there it is. <laughs> yeah. Label it that. Um, okay. um, a question here from Jay. Um, he said, "Are there are there any protections for buyers that entered into a contract prior to the forms being released that have experienced job loss and our and our pat? I'm sorry." and are past our third party fin financing periods, but have to terminate and cannot close. Is there an earnest money dispute here? Well, whether pre-form, post-form, there is nothing in the contract that allows for you to kick out of it or terminate it because of what we call force majeure or some catastrophic event, act of God, mm -hmm. pandemic, that clause does not exist, so you're stuck with the contract. And so I guess I guess my advice on that is if the person, one of the parties has an issue on closing because of brought about by the pandemic, I think that should be laid out, communicated as best possible to the other side. I would I would I would think that if somebody tries to enforce or litigate an issue of earnest money or, or or anything really related to somebody in need because of the pandemic. I think that's a t even though the contract might be on your side. I think that's a tough case mm -hmm. to pursue because I think the jury and the judge are not going to be on your side. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I think because of the times we're in, I think you you know you have to double down on fairness and being reasonable all parties I mean that's kind of my spin on it because I I think that I think yes the contract is silent on that issue but the community won't be okay uh, CLO asks can we use the COVID-19 addendum to extend the closing on a cash deal if so can a buyer terminate based on this addendum even if a cat even if it is a cash transaction but he decides he does not does not perform for the current market situation. Sorry, that's a lot. Well, that's a good question. You know, I uh, I saw that TR on their FAQ said it doesn't apply to a cash deal. But I, the way I read the addendum, if 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 the addendum has been put in place and the parties have signed off on it, I read I I think it can be argued that it does apply to a cash sale. And on the presumption that there is evidence in, in the event that something does bec become an issue, that there is evidence that this person's cash, pos cash position has changed mm -hmm. because of the, the virus, the market, debt, business, you know, 
all, all of the things you might think of that might are going on with certain people that you know the cash may not be there like it was or may be needed somewhere else and so my i think there's an argument that addendum still applies to a cash event even though I'll, like i said tr said it did not okay someone's asking you to predict the future here <laughs> what is the opinion well, I, what is your opinion on the future of real estate well i'm glad you asked because i i, I i'm optimistic about it all i uh i think I think you folks, all you know, us in real estate, and specifically members and people want, and real specifically people watching this this webinar. I think it's a great opportunity for for uh, realtors. I think it's a, ne I mean, never before. I mean, we've had a lot of disruption going on the last year. This is really disruption, but I think it's created a super great opportunity for realtors. I mean, because people. The non-realtors, the buyers, the sellers, they're looking for certainty. They're looking for somebody that can walk them through something, that can give them advice, that can answer their questions. So now more than ever, I think realtors should double down on gaining knowledge in their spare time, on answering questions in a timely manner, on giving advice, even if the advice is not asked for. You're a professional, provide advice. Doesn't mean they'll listen to it. They don't have to listen to it. <laughs> Sometimes they won't listen to it. And don't get your feelings hurt. Listen, seriously. If everybody listened to the advice I've given all these years, the world would be perfect. <laughs> they haven't, and so that's fine. Uh, so, I think your role in this market is critical, more so ever, and then going forward as we, because there's a look. There's a lot of uncertainty, and you need to be the voice of certainty. You need to be the voice on, on answering being timely, providing good advice, you know, doing, doing your duties as you normally would do, but even more so, you know, gain, gain that knowledge, gain that confidence with your client, answer, timing. I mean, all these things that you've been told, I mean, really, really take hold of them because this is, I think this is a great opportunity for, uh, for uh, you in this market going forward. Very good. Um, while you were saying that, Lydia said, OMG, I love it. So she loved hearing what you had to say. Um, Shad Bogany, just a reminder to everyone about the 2020 census. He was saying, Grant, <laughs> the 2020 Sorry, Shad, I meant to cover that. I, I, I was, it was actually, I was getting there. It was still on the list. Okay. Um, and the, uh, so as several people were asking, and I saw a few people answer um, that this is being recorded. We're going to put it on HR's YouTube channel, and we'll be sharing it um, later later this afternoon. So or, or this evening, we'll have that up for you guys. Yes, sir. Well, no disclosure. We didn't do that, did we? Oh no, we didn't. So we have just a few minutes left. So let's yeah. hear it. Yes. Let's get on that real quick because I know people have asked it. I've been asked this question, so it may be on people's mind about. Um, there it is. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, so the issue may come up about disclosing the virus or, you know, obviously that's the main health condition that comes to people's mind. And so in the seller disclosure notice, section eight, here's the, here's the lead into the section. And then there's the question, any condition on the property, which materially affects the health or safety of an individual. And I think it could be argued that if there was a virus, if somebody that had been in the property or lives in the property had the virus while in the property, uh, then you know that to me is an issue of disclosure. And so it's 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 a sort of a slippery slope because you know how long how long does that duty go on for 14 days or two months? Good question. Mm -hmm. I think I think the further in time you get away from it, the less event of disclosure. But um, I, it is something that um, if 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 the and, and another thing here also is you have to be careful of HIPAA rules. You know, privacy rules related to somebody's health condition. If the if it's if it involves a seller, meaning it's the seller that perhaps had this condition, then you would, you know, this this appears to be a consent in writing if they're going to fill this out, sign it, and provide it. But also, you would probably 
want to have that discussion with your seller on this issue, get something in writing, an email exchange, something allowing you or allowing them, allowing you ultimately to provide this document, which you there is no question on that, but just sort of a backup, if you will, that you had the discussion, uh, they authorized the disclosure, they answer this question the way it is, and um, and leave it at that. So I mean, it's it's a it's it's something that you know, if if it comes up, if, if when they're filling out the disclosure statement, which is their duty, not your duty, uh, if this issue comes up on on whether and they disclose that they had that situation occur, then I think it's an event of disclosure. But you know, it, it's not it's not incumbent upon you to ask the question. So don't don't build too much pressure on yourself to address this. It's really, it's really if it comes up, if they bring it up to you. I mean, because like I said, it's not your duty to fill out this statement, it's their duty. Right. And if in the course of filling it out, this issue of maybe somebody having the virus in the property, then have that discussion, make a decision, talk to your broker, uh, make a decision on disclosure and, uh, and document it. Mm -hmm. Um, so a few questions here about privacy rules. Uh, someone said their husband's employer won't even allow them, won't allow anyone at work to let them, to let them know if they've had it. So it seems like a privacy issue. Um, it is a, it is a privacy issue, but that's why it's real. But if, if the seller is the one and that's their privacy issue and, and if they voluntarily provide information, then, then in writing consent to this volunteer providing information, which is really what this question is. Mm -hmm. And also if you have the email exchange allowing that to occur, then, um, then you should be fine. Okay. Glenda just asked, is COVID a condition of the property? Well, the, you know, the issue, of course, now I'm, I'm not, I'm not in Washington at the news conference you know, giving opinions, but, um, you know, the issue is, is the germs or whatever care, you know, the, whatever is left in the house and how long that is active or contagious or stuff of that nature. I mean, it's, so that's, that is a condition in the property. Yes. Okay. Very good. Uh, we have to, the property. do we have, uh, we have just a couple minutes left. Is there anything else you wanted to share with us, Grant? No, I gave my uh, I gave my speech there about the the um, about the, uh, the the future, um, and I'm looking at our bullet points. Make sure we we hit everything, and I think we did. Um, okay. Uh, you know, there was also I think. Some had, and we've had these questions about, hey, we need a a release of liability, basically just saying, you know, whatever we do relative with the client or the property, they can't sue us for virus issues. I mean, I'm just, and I think, I think that's a tough document to create where you, a, you could have somebody would actually be willing to sign it, meaning that. I'll, if you sign it, I can't sue you, and, and I'm identifying you for any issue related to coronavirus. I mean, that's a that's a document. I wonder if anybody would sign, and if you did sign it, I wonder whether it would be enforceable. And so, to the extent that somebody is in need or a client wants that type of document, like some sort of broad release, releasing them from anybody visiting the property or anything related to associated with the selling of the property and the coronavirus, I think that's, I think that's not really for us as the association to come up with that document. I think it's probably should be left up to the individual property owner and their lawyer. All right. Very good. A lot of our members are thanking you. They're saying helpful information, great information. So again, thank you so much, uh, Grant, for your time today. Um, I want to remind everyone that uh, tomorrow we will have Brad Inman of Inman News. If that name sounds familiar, that's because you probably get <laughs> their updates and their emails from Inman News. Brad Inman will be on with HR's president and CEO, Bob Hale. Uh, later this week, we have Christine Kennelly with uh, Realtor.com on how to 
uh, stay relevant now that will help you in your business in the, in the, in the coming months as things hopefully get back to normal sooner rather than later. Um, so be on the lookout for all of those. If you haven't registered, har.com slash webinars. We also have some scheduled next week and we are scheduling some in May. So again, har.com slash webinars is where you can sign up for it. Grant, again, thank you so much for your time today. This was wonderful. Thank you, Christina. Great job. You did great <laughs> as usual. <laughs> thank you guys. Uh, and we hope everyone has a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.